For everyone who's joining us for the webinar tonight, my name is Megan Gleason. I'm one of the physicians at Orthopedic and Neurosurgery Specialists. Um, I will do an introduction in a few minutes, but we just want to give people a little bit of time to join the webinar. So we're just going to sit quiet for a few more minutes to allow people to join us, um, and then we'll get started with the presentation. Okay, I'm going to start with a brief introduction here. Um, I think we're going to have some other people who will join us um, as their schedules allow. Um, so we'll just get started. Um, so welcome and thank you for joining us for our webinar. We're talking today about the female athlete in her 40s and beyond. Um, we have a um, good series of information that we hope you find um, informational and informative about uh, women uh, as we age and, and some of the special concerns we think about. Um, my name is Megan Gleason. I'm an orthopedic uh, surgeon who specializes in sports medicine. I'll be talking a little bit about um, some of the patients that I treat and the situations um, that bring people into my office for further care. I'm also joined tonight by Ashley Moriarty. She is a physical therapist and an orthopedic clinical specialist. She also does work with pre and postnatal care. Um, she is going to be talking about weight training. Um, in the over 40 population, um, general exercise recommendations and optimal performance strategies. We also have Jessica Klecki, who is also a physical therapist who specializes in pelvic health, and she will be talking about hormonal changes of the pelvic floor musculature, um, both peri and postnatal. Um, in the per I'm sorry, peri and postmenopausal <laughs> stages, um, as well as other techniques to, to combat um, urinary leakage and other symptoms related to that. Um, so we will be um, kind of going through a variety of, of topics. Um, we'll have a little bit of overlap, but hopefully we'll kind of approach this from different um, perspectives. Um, and then at the end, we'll do a Q&A session. Um, we will see your questions uh, come up, um, but we will be waiting until the end of the presentations to address them. Uh, but hopefully we'll have time to get through everything. Um, so I'm gonna start. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Okay. All right. Hopefully everyone can see this. Um, so I'm going to talk about common orthopedic injuries that I see in women after the age of 40 and hopefully how to avoid them um, when possible. Um, so we're going to talk about first my specialty, which is orthopedic sports medicine, and then I'm going to talk about considerations in women over the age of 45 and up to 50, 65 and plus. Um, talk about some common soft tissue injuries I see, as well as some common bony injuries or issues, as well as a, we'll touch briefly on some injury prevention and treatment options for you all. So orthopedic surgery, just in general, um, is a field of medicine where we address surgical and non-surgical management, bone, ligament, tendon, muscle, and nerve injuries. So we cover a very broad spectrum of um, the anatomy of the body. 
Um, there are multiple specialties within orthopedics. We talk about joint replacements, spine surgery, hand surgery, foot and ankle, trauma, pediatrics, oncology. Um, and these are all, again, addressing different parts of the body and different um, elements of motion and movement and keeping the body nice and strong. Um, so different bones, different joints, different tendons, but sports medicine in particular is a subspecialty within orthopedics where it's not just about athletes. Um, we do treat people who are not necessarily participating formally in an athletic field, but in sports medicine in, in general, it covers a wide range of people as well as patients. So we do focus on athletic performance, health and wellness, injury prevention, assessment and treatment of injuries. And it's usually a team of people. So myself as an orthopedic surgeon, I also work hand in hand with primary care doctors, physician assistants, physical therapists, coaches, chiropractors, nutritionists. So it's a very broad field. Um, I particularly love working in it because I do get to work with a variety of people toward bringing each of my patients toward their goals of care, whether it's, you know, participation in um, optimization in a sport or just general health and wellness. They want to get out and walk. They want to start running. Uh, they just don't want to be in pain doing the activities that they enjoy. And so as you'll see today, we'll be talking with some physical therapists and we do have an, a lot of overlap in what we treat and, and how we take care of people. So we're talking specifically about women and Ashley's gonna to touch a little bit this, on this as well. We do talk about bone density and that's um, measured in the terms of a T-score. We talk about osteopenia and osteoporosis when that bone density starts to drop. With women in particular, we also look at decreases in muscle mass, which just happens naturally over time decreases in flexibility. Fortunately, as much as we try to fight it, we just get a little bit stiffer and also different um, considerations from a diet and nutrition perspective. So just to touch very briefly on, um, on um, our you know, bone density and, and osteoporosis, osteopenia. So bone remodeling is a natural process that happens throughout our whole life, but as we age, it tends to happen a little bit faster, especially in women after menopause. So bone is gonna break down faster than it rebuilds. But again, this is a natural process, but it's not um, something we wanna see. Um, estrogen, menopause, these different levels can accelerate that breakdown process, which can in turn lead to osteoporosis, which is essentially a condition where the bones become more brittle. Our bone density peaks in the late 20s and 30s, so that's an optimal time. So for those of you with younger family members, especially women, this is the time you really wanna um, focus on getting optimal amounts of calcium and vitamin D. And at 50, that's when the bone density starts to decline. It happens much more um, commonly in women, but it does happen in men as well. And that does affect um, the body's ability to recover, especially after injury. Um, so some things when we talk about osteoporosis, there are things that we can control and things that we can't um, with a lot of things in life. Um, being female just puts you at higher risk. Um, being Caucasian or Asian and low BMI also just inherently puts you at a higher risk as well as family history. Things that you can control, activity, and Ashley's going to touch upon this. Um, smoking and diet can also affect um, your likelihood to develop osteoporosis. Unfortunately, certain medical conditions or medications that people take can also um, predispose you or, or increase your likelihood of having issues with your bone. So treatment, and we'll go into this in a little bit more detail. We talk about, about calcium and vitamin D supplementation, weight-bearing exercise. If you're a smoker, trying to quit, and then trying to, if possible, avoid medications that um, can affect your, your bone remodeling. So just to touch on these things, um, these are very commonly heard. You'll see them on TV, you'll, you'll hear them around, but there are different types of medications um, that are geared toward treatment of osteoporosis. These are very complex medications. I'm not gonna go into them in great detail, um, but there's pros and cons to, to all of these. So it's not a really easy thing where we can just say, oh, you have osteopenia, osteoporosis, take this medication and everything will be better. Um, but there are a lot of options um, and a lot of these medications, again, they have different biologic activity and different pharmacology for, so, you know, the treatment or the use of these medications is really geared toward the individual patient. So this is a discussion to have either with your primary care doctor or oftentimes with an endocrinologist on what is going to be the safest and most reasonable medication for you. Again, these don't come without risk. Um, so that's why, you know, as as nice as it would be if we could find something that would just fix osteoporosis, it's unfortunately not quite that easy. 
So obviously, you know, to keep yourself healthy, we want to keep the bones healthy, um, maintaining a good diet and using weighted exercise, maintaining muscle tone as much as possible. And it's often done through lifting weights. We don't, it doesn't mean you're slinging around, you know, lots of steel. This isn't, you know, crazy gym lifting, but enough to, to main, mu maintain muscle tone and to build some strength and also balance your nutrition. Flexibility is also really important. So, you know, activities such as yoga and Pilates are often very popular because they're very beneficial. And again, balancing that diet is, is so essential. So to talk a little bit about the things that I see, um, sprains and fractures come at all ages, but we do see them in, in the over 40 population, especially depending on the types of activities that people participate in. Oftentimes sprains and fractures are not intentional. Um, it comes from a trip of ball, twisting the wrong way. I see it a lot in pickleball, tennis, even people who go for a run and just kind of step wrong on a tree branch or something like that. Um, it usually comes from more of a traumatic situation, meaning unintentional. But then I also do treat a fair amount of tendonitis, bursitis, or strains and pulls that can come from overuse. And a lot of that is really geared toward the types of activities that people are participating in. In particular, one other kind of soft tissue injury that I see often is adhesive capsulitis, which is also known as frozen shoulder. Um, this is inherently just much more common in women. It is also more likely in people who struggle with diabetes or thyroid problems. And so that can come without trauma, without injury, without any reason. Unfortunately, sometimes people are just unlucky and develop um, adhesive capsulitis. If you're having trouble with shoulder motion, pain, you just feel a lot of stiffness, it's, it's definitely worth an evaluation because it could be something that unfortunately women are just more prone to developing. Bony injuries, and this kind of plays a little bit off of the osteoporosis. Um, depending on the activities that you're doing, stress fractures can be more common. Um, the MRI that you're seeing down at the bottom shows evidence of a stress fracture. And this can come with increased impact activity. So we're, we're telling you to do more impact to keep your bones healthy, but it can't be um, without caution because you can develop stress fractures as a result. Um, as bones weaken and become slightly more brittle, the risk of fractures, um, especially in the wrist, the shoulder, or the hip goes up, um, which is very unfortunate. And, and small falls or kind of little trips where it, maybe 10, 15, 20 years ago, it was nothing can now result in a break. Another thing that we often treat are spinal compression fractures. And that's something we really want to avoid for pain and posture is not seeing a, a compression fracture that results in some deformity. And unfortunately, these are not, some of these have to be treated surgically, but some of these um, don't do well with surgery. So try to avoid them in the first place is optimal. Hip fractures um, are obviously very difficult fractures. They come, um, more commonly in, in a more geriatric or elderly population, but even in young women, um, it can happen if they are struggling with osteoporosis and do have just a minor fall. Um, morbidity is increased in men. Men tend to don't, not do as well with these types of fractures, but nonetheless, um, obviously we wanna avoid anybody having to, to deal with an injury of this likelihood. And then touching a little bit more on elective surgeries that we see for other reasons, not related to trauma. Um, in the over 40 population, I see a lot of rotator cuff injuries or bicep tendon injuries, also ACL and meniscal injuries. So these are common things depending on the activities. Um, for those people who have developed arthritis in either the hip, knee, or shoulder, shoulder replacement becomes much more common after the age of 40 and into the 50s and 60s. So these are all things that um, you, your family members, people that you know might be struggling with because these are just things that have a tendency to occur a little bit more commonly in, in this older population. Total me, um, this is just some data, uh, which is you know, not meant to be pessimistic, but women do tend to lose cartilage a little bit faster than men. Um, patellofemoral or arthritis behind the kneecap is much more common in women than it is in men. Um, you'll hear kind of marketing, there, there was a trend at one point about a more gender-specific implant, so a narrower, you know, implant that was geared toward women. That has not shown to have any improvement outcomes, but there is a marketing opportunity, so you, know, you may read or hear about that option. So, you know, in dealing with these injuries, we talk a lot about treatment, but we also talk a lot about prevention. Obviously, trying to prevent these injuries or, or problems from occurring in the first place is optimal. So in order to prevent, we think a lot about preparation and planning, um, training and cross-training as well as conditioning. I'm a big proponent of cross-training. I don't think you can just go out and pound and do the th same things over and over again. So varying your activities, trying to um, add a lot of 
variety to your, your workout schedule. You don't have to work out every single day. It doesn't have to be something that becomes onerous, but you know, trying to do things to improve your overall health is obviously optimal. Um, you know, common sense is a part of it. You know, if you're starting to have pain, you know, not pushing through discomfort, not just pushing through pain and trying to make some modifications as well as seeking out physical therapy. And we'll talk a little bit more from our physical therapists about the importance of trying to address problems early so they don't become worse over time. So prevention, um, we talk a lot about fitness plans, cross training, gradually building endurance, making sure nutritionally you're balanced as well. And then just being in good general medical health. Um, you know, from a cross training perspective for people who like to run, bike, you know, sometimes mixing and swimming, if that's an option, can be a really great way to get cardio and strength training, building endurance without putting as much pressure through the joints. And then now we'll talk a little bit about treatment. So this is one of my favorite cartoons, we're icing our knees. We're taking, you know, different medications that are over the counter for inflammation and relief. Sometimes we talk about supplements like glucosamine chondroitin, and sometimes it's just a question of needing some rest and needing to let your body rest and recover. And so these are all things that we'll think about when we get into the treatment elements. So activity modification, ice and heat, using anti-inflammatories. Sometimes um, when I see patients, we'll talk about some injections, whether it's cortisone, platelet-rich plasma, there's different things that can help settle down tendon joint injuries. And then oftentimes I, I want to say I refer almost all of my patients to physical therapy when appropriate to work on strengthening flexibility, balance, realignment, um, to try to get them back to the activities they were doing prior. Some people unfortunately do need surgery. Um, for the knee, the most common things I'm seeing are, are meniscal or ACL surgeries, as well as joint replacements. Um, in the shoulder, sometimes we have to address the rotator cuff, the, ten the tendons. Man MUA stands for manipulation under anesthesia. So if we need to loosen up someone with a frozen shoulder, sometimes that does need to be addressed surgically. The surgical options in my mind are the last stop. If we can't address these conservatively, then sometimes we have to go in that direction. But obviously, we're going to do as much as we can to try to avoid that. So I just have some information in our office in... Um, we have Wilton, uh, a new Wilton location um, with ONS, but we're also located in Greenwich, Stamford, and Harrison, as well as a spine office up in Danbury. So here's information on our newest office, as well as the contact information for Ashley and Jessica. But at this point, I'll turn it over to Ashley, and you can take over. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, let's see how smoothly I can screen share. Um, great. Okay, so I'm just basically going to pick up exactly where you left off, uh, but I'm going to focus a little bit more on the osteoporosis side of things and then looking at some general recommendations for exercise and recovery for this over 40 population um, and specifically females. So who am I? A uh, physical therapist. I'm the site leader of our new Canaan office. I have a Bachelor of Science in Athletic Training, so working primarily with athletes. And then I went on to get my doctorate in physical therapy from Boston University. Um, I'm also an orthopedic clinical specialist, and then I further subspecialize in pre and postnatal performance. So you'll hear from Jessica in a little bit, and she is a specialist in pelvic floor physical therapy. So I don't have that certification. So I'm a little bit more on the performance side, exercise-based side of things. Sorry, sorry. Um, so perimenopause, just to put a definition out there, um, which Dr. Gleason had mentioned before, we're gonna speak about a little bit, is this, the period of time before you actually hit menopause. And this can happen anytime between 35 and 45 years of age. There's no specific number and everyone's gonna hit at a little bit of a different point. So some common signs and symptoms that you're in perimenopause or starting to get into this phase are changes in your menstrual cycle, um, which means irregularities. And then that is eventually going to progress into cessation of your menstrual cycle completely for 12 months. And Jess is going to talk a little bit more about that. But this irregularity in cycle is what really defines perimenopause. You're also going to potentially have headaches, increase in joint pain and back pain, nighttime wakings, night sweats, hot flashes, mood changes, and overall loss of bone density. So all of these are like really negative, pessimistic, um, which is the word Dr. Gleason means like bad things. So we are here to try to help give you some advice and information about like, what can you do about this stuff, right? So there's no question that you can't prevent perimenopause and menopause from happening, but how can we ease the transition into that period and make you as optimal in terms of your health and your exercise and your overall well-being as we possibly can? 
So bone density um, overall is just the amount of minerals in your bones. Specifically, we're looking at calcium. So uh, Dr. Gleason had a really great picture up and I think my next slide has it as well, but bone is like a sponge, right? So you see these little holes in it and it's this trabecular inner bone that we're looking at. When you have a decrease in bone density, the, the holes in the sponge get a little bit bigger. So there's just more air and more space, which leads to that more brittle bone. Overall happens most rapidly around the ages of 50 to 54, depending on when you actually hit menopause. Um, from like birth to 35-ish, we're constantly creating more bone. So the cells in our body that make bone are working at a faster rate than the cells that break down bone. So we're always getting more and more bone. Then like 35 to 45-ish, we're at a steady state, maybe losing a little bit. But when we hit that 50 to 54, bone loss uh, speeds up pretty dramatically, mostly because of lower estrogen. And Jess is going to really go into that later. And then like Dr. Gleason like Dr. said, females are just at more of a risk. Unfortunately, it's about a one to four ratio between male and female in terms of how quickly we lose bone mass um, and how many of us lose that bone mass. So how you measure osteoporosis, and here's that picture of kind of normal bone and spongy bone uh, or with more holes in it, is a DEXA scan. That's kind of the gold standard. So it's just comparing you to a healthy match of someone who's your age. Um, and they try to get as close as possible. Your age, your body composition, your race, all that. Um, plus one to negative one is considered normal. Uh, negative one to negative 2.5 is what we consider um, osteopenic, which is you have low bone mass, but not necessarily osteoporosis. And things that might predispose females to becoming osteopenic are hereditary factors, certain medications or medicines such as steroids, and then overall low body weight or low BMI. Uh, this is also because females in general and people who are a little bit smaller just tend to have smaller bones. So you're already starting with less bone. So when you lose bone, the effect is a little bit more dramatic. And then anything negative 2.5 or lower is considered osteoporotic. So what can we do for good bone health, right? So that was all of the bad stuff. Um, modifiable risk factors that you can really control are diet and lifestyle. So um, it is never too late to start but it's always better to start early. So those of us who are 25 to 35, who have you know, daughters or family members who are 25 to 35, this is the time where you can really maximize and optimize what you're doing to maintain and create good bone health before you get to that point where you're gonna lose it um, at a certain rate, no matter what. So if you are past that point and you are already losing bone mass, it's still not too late. We're not gonna get you more bone mass, but we can slow down the rate that you're losing it. So either way, you, it's better to start early, but it's never too late to actually start and get going. So a couple of dietary recommendations. Um, like I said, bone mineral density, we're really looking at calcium. So by the time you hit 35-ish or so, the recommendation is about 100 or 1,000 milligrams of calcium a day. Once you hit that perimenopause or menopausal stage, that bumps up to 1,200 milligrams per day. And it is more preferable to get your calcium through food than through supplements. So a couple of different foods that have calcium, of course, milk, everyone knows that, dairy, but salmon, dark leafy greens, kale, broccoli, that kind of thing. Vitamin D is so important because it actually helps the body absorb calcium. So you could drink as much milk as you want, but if you don't actually get some vitamin D along with that, your body's going to have a harder time absorbing that. So sunlight, fortified milk, or supplementation would all be um, really great ways to get vitamin D. Lifestyle and exercise recommendations. This is kind of my wheelhouse. So Gravity dependent resistive exercise is really the best way to promote good bone health and good healthy bones. So it improves bone density if you're in a phase where you can still improve bone density or it slows the rate of bone loss if you're already in that perimenopause menopausal phase. Um, bones and muscles have a really positive response to mechanical load. So that is compression, torsion, pulling on the bones, twisting the bones, any stress that you add to the bones in a healthy, supervised way is going to be good for it. Obviously, um, using common sense, we don't want to overload too quickly. So having someone really take you through a supervised, well-structured program is important here. Uh, also, gravity-dependent resistant exercise helps improve strength and muscle mass, which are then going to help load the bone appropriately. They're going to lead to improved pelvic floor function. And this, again, is just as kind of thing to talk about. But I mention it because people who have better pelvic floor function are more likely to participate in regular exercise. 
if you are someone who has urinary incontinence or you leak a lot or you have heaviness in your pelvic floor, the chance that you participate in regular exercise goes down because those symptoms can be uncomfortable. Um, it also leads to improved balance, which we know decreases risk of falling. And then aerobic training and high impact training. So aerobic training is great, right? Walking, biking, swimming. They're just not enough. They are kind of normal day-to-day, -day. like walking is great. I do not want to discount the positive effects of walking, but walking is like you're normal. So even though you're getting a cardio benefit, you're not actually loading your bones any more than what is kind of your baseline. So walking, biking, swimming are all great when used in combination with strength training. And then high impact training is great unless you are already osteopenic or osteoporotic, right? If you're already in those classifications, high impact training can actually be more harmful than good. So again, working with um, somebody who's a licensed provider who can give you some guidance on what you should be doing is really important. General exercise guidelines. So any source you look at is going to tell you that 150 to 300 minutes um, a week of moderate intensity aerobic activity is sufficient with at least two days of strength training. This is a great standard, but it doesn't actually give enough guidance. So what does moderate intensity aerobic exercise feel like? What, what ways are you getting it? Is it all swimming, which is no gravity, right? You're kind of suspended in the pool. Is it all walking? Is it all elliptical? And then strength training, right? What is enough? What is too much? Are you using all of the muscle groups? Are you only isolating certain muscle groups? So as a general exercise recommendation, I think this is fantastic. And for a lot of people, this will be enough of a place to kind of get started. But again, really tailoring it to what you need, what phase of your life are you in? Um, do you have any risk factors that put you at higher risk of already becoming osteopenic or osteoporotic? And just working with someone who has some expertise in this field to get you on an individualized program. And then a couple of sleep recommendations that I always like to give people because uh, they're a little bit easier to just implement. So I mentioned earlier that a sign of perimenopause is getting um, night sweats or hot flashes. So these can disrupt sleep, obviously. Another reason why sleep might be disrupted is you actually have a lower melatonin production. So a lot of people, if not you, you know someone who take melatonin supplements. They work for some people, they don't work for everyone, but lower melatonin production can lead to less um, a lower quality of sleep night after night. So a couple of um, recommendations for increasing your chance of having a good night's sleep night after night are just getting into a better routine. So there's nothing that we're gonna do specifically from an exercise, uh, exercise standpoint that's gonna change the hormonal changes that are happening. But if you have a good bedtime routine, right? It's brush your teeth, wash your face, put your pajamas on, lay in bed, maybe you're reading just something to wind down that kind of signals your brain, okay, it's time to go to bed. This is why people who go out for dinner can't come home and jump right into bed, right? They have to like watch TV for 20 minutes, read a book. It's just their wind down routine. Making sure your room is cool and dark. So I think the optimal temperature is 65. That is definitely not my optimal temperature, but that is kind of what has been found to be the best. So 65 to 68, dark room. So no street lights coming in, no uh, bedside lamps on, no TV on. And which leads me to my next point, no extra lights or TV before bed, because this can stimulate um, your brain to say like, it's time to wake up and we're, we're trying to do the opposite. And then no exercise and eating right before bed. So we want to make sure there's at least a two hour window before any eating, big meals or exercising. Um, and when we hop into bed for the night. And then overall stress management recommendations related to changes in mood. So these can be a product of the hormonal shifts that we um, undergo when we're in that perimenopause or menopausal phase, or it can be a product of poor sleep quality, right? You sleep really poorly one night, you wake up the next day, you're super irritable. Now imagine that night after night after night because of hot flashes or whatever else. So mood swings, irritability, and some episodes of depression. So a couple of general recommendations would be getting into some kind of meditation. There's a million and one apps out there five minutes before you go to bed, five minutes when you wake up. Um, mental health counseling, if doing something on your own is not enough, right? If your form of stress management is just not working anymore or working differently because you're in this new phase of life, seeking out a mental health counselor who specializes in menopause or perimenopause or whatever it is that is creating stress in your life. And then coming up with some positive stress management techniques, exercise, hobbies, social support, whatever it might be. And all of that kind of playing off what Dr. Gleason said, I'm gonna to pass to Jessica, who's gonna talk a little bit more about pelvic floor function and changes, and then that lower estrogen that we have in those perimenopause and menopausal phases. Hi everyone, thanks Ashley. Let me 
try to see if I can share my screen. Uh, no, that wasn't right. Let's see. We'll get it. There we go. All right. Hopefully everyone can see that okay. Um, I am Jessica Klecky. I am also a physical therapist with performance, but I specialize in pelvic floor physical therapy. So we can't really have a conversation about the pelvic floor without talking about the pelvic floor first. Um, so I'm gonna go over some just brief anatomy so that you have a better idea of the area of the body that we're talking about. And if this is all news to you, don't feel bad, don't be embarrassed. Most people don't know that these muscle ex muscles exist. Um, and the anatomy is going to actually be pretty similar between men and women. So yes, your husband's sons, they have pelvic floors too. But tonight we're talking about the ladies. Um, so the pelvic floor muscles are going to kind of act like a hammock or a bowl. And they're going to kind of go from front to back and side to side at the bottom of the pelvis, sort of filling that bowl. And they're gonna act as the bottom of our can if we wanna consider our core like a can. I always like to have my can present with me because it's helpful. Um, so hopefully you can still see me in my tiny square. The pelvic floor muscles are going to be the bottom of your can. So they're really gonna be that, that support. The top of your can is going to be the diaphragm, which sits right underneath the lungs and allows you to inflate your lungs when you breathe in and sort of compress those lungs and push the air out when the, when the diaphragm comes up. The front of the can is going to be all of your core muscles and the back is going to be our, our back extensors, those big back muscles. And all together, these four groups are going to make up your core. So you can see why the pelvic floor muscles would have such a big supportive function. Um, they're, they're going to not only support the pelvis and support your pelvic organ alignment, but they're also going to help you to maintain your urinary and fecal continence because they're also going to wrap around the rectum, the vagina, and the urethra. So they're really going to help sort of act as a sphincter um, so that you can have bowel movements and, and urinate when you need to, but not have leakage during activities or when you cough, laugh, and sneeze. These muscles, of course, kind of obviously are also going to have a big role in sexual function and orgasm. Um, they also act as a sort of sump pump um, where they're going to help bring blood flow back up sort of into the system. Um, so if that's not working well, you can also get some heaviness or some swelling and inflammation in this area. So we're here today to sort of talk about perimenopause and menopause. And as Ashley sort of touched on, um, perimenopause is going to be sort of the beginning of those changes in the hormones. Whereas menopause is going to be when your period has actually stopped and you haven't had a period for 12 months. So perimenopause is sort of this in-between um, kind of time frame where it doesn't really have a specific beginning. So sometimes it's hard to identify, um, but that is really going to be where the hormones start to kind of go on this crazy roller coaster. So we're having decreases in estrogen, decreases in progesterone, decreases in collagen, and an increase in cortisol. And as Ashley also mentioned, you're having a decrease in melatonin. So what does that really mean? What, what happens to not only your body, but to the pelvic floor? So all of those symptoms that Ashley listed, the headaches, the joint pain, all of that is going to be as a result of the change in these hormones. But specifically, these, these hormones are going to affect your pelvic floor health and function. The pelvic floor muscles love estrogen. They, they eat it up. They need it to be strong. They need it to be healthy. And so as these hormones start to decrease, you're going to also see a decrease in the, the plumpness or the, the strength of the pelvic floor muscles. They start to atrophy a little bit and can get um, a little smaller, a little weaker, but they're also going to lose their flexibility just like the rest of the muscles in your body. So now we have these sort of weaker muscles that aren't working that great. Um, and they're also kind of tight and irritated because they've lost that flexibility. So what can we, what, what can that show up as? Um, that's going to show up as urinary urgency. You're having to go to the bathroom every 45 minutes, or maybe it's every two hours, but when it comes on, that urge is so strong, you're running to the bathroom. You know where every bathroom is all around town. 
or maybe you are having leakage. You're, you're having leakage during, you know, coughing, laughing, sneezing, during intercourse, um, with activity, um, or on the flip of that, it's during that urgency. You're rushing, rushing, rushing to the bathroom and you're not making it in time. Maybe the leakage is small, it's just a few drops, or maybe you're having full kind of loss of bladder because you just didn't make it to the toilet in time. This can also look like constipation. Um, the pelvic floor muscles have to work properly in order for us to completely empty our bladder and to completely um, have a complete bowel movement. Um, so constipation is sometimes a symptom that can be really easily overlooked. This can also feel like heaviness in the vagina. I mentioned that the pelvic floor muscles act as a sump pump. So sometimes that heaviness is just a sort of congestion in the area. Um, the blood flow just isn't being returned super well. It's kind of like having swollen feet. Um, if you don't put your feet up at the end of the night, you get some swelling. That can sort of happen here as well. Or it could be um, sort of the beginning of prolapse. Um, and I know that's kind of a scary word if you've ever heard of it before, but it doesn't mean that, you know, your organs are just falling out of your body. Is all that means is that that weakness in the pelvic floor muscles has allowed the bladder or the rectum to sort of come in and push into that vaginal wall. Um, and so it can sort of feel like, feel like heaviness. Um, you can also end up not can, you will end up with some vaginal dryness. Um, you need estrogen in order to produce lubrication. So vaginal dryness is, is bound to happen at some point during this process, um, which can lead to decreased libido, but sometimes that's just from that, that lack of estrogen. You're also um, having decreased testosterone during this time as well. So that's definitely going to affect, you know, how often you're, you're wanting to have intercourse. Now, the pain with intercourse can come from a few, a few different areas. So it can be the vaginal dryness um, and maybe some lubricant solves that for you, but it could also be due to that lack of flexibility within those pelvic floor muscles. So we always just think of the muscles as, as weak as we're just having leakage, but that lack of flexibility can really cause increased tone through those muscles. And there might be pain with intercourse due to that lack of flexibility. And this can also look like low back and hip pain. The pelvic floor really likes to throw pain around. It likes to sort of refer out. So sometimes that, that tightness within the pelvic floor can be felt as low back or hip pain, or because that pelvic floor is such a big support system of that core can, lack of stability through the pelvic floor leads to um, the low back and the hip muscles really trying to overcompensate to provide that stability. Uh, so it, it could look like just back pain, but the problem isn't coming from the back. So treating the back or just getting the core stronger isn't solving your problems because it's really coming from that lack of stability underneath. So what can we really do about these changes? We've all thrown at you these horrible hormonal changes that you can't affect, like that's just, just they're going to happen. Um, so as Ashley kind of touched on, you know, really trying to optimize your sleep quality, your stress management, your nutrition and getting regular movement can really help to minimize the effects that those hormone changes are having on you. Um, there are also providers out there, your, your gynecologist, um, your gyno, gyno urogyne, your urologist, these practitioners may suggest doing some kind of hormonal supplement, whether it's um, supplementation, whether it's an estrogen cream, it could be suppositories, um, it could be pills, um, there's patches. So depending on where your levels are and how severe your symptoms are, there are other practitioners out there who have different tools um, for helping you regulate that hormonal change. But really just with the bone you know, density, trying to act before you've had symptoms is really going to be our best bet for our pelvic floor. You'll see my cute little piggy bank um, picture up here. And that's because we really want to try to put as many coins in our piggy bank as we can. So that way, when we are sort of taking away strength, taking away flexibility, that yes, we're losing some change here and there, but we really have this good stockpile of how strong and coordinated our pelvic floor can be. 
So uh, the pelvic floor has to have really good coordination to be healthy. You need to be able to contract those muscles. So if you've ever heard of a Kegel, yes, that is technically a pelvic floor contraction. But you also, on the flip side, need to be able to lengthen those muscles. So usually women will come in saying, you know, I've been doing 200 Kegels a day, and I cringe a little because they're only doing one part of the movement. So more likely than not, those muscles are holding too much tone. They've lost that flexibility. And, and now they're not working well because those muscles are too short. If you were a waitress and you were carrying around a tray all day, eight hours and never put your arm down. As soon as you put that tray down, if you went to pick up your can, it's probably going to feel really heavy because those muscles have been held in that shortened state for so long that when you're going to try to use them, now they're tired, they're overworked and they're not working well. So just because you have leakage doesn't mean that it's only a strength issue. It could be a coordination issue as well. Then we have the strength. Of course, we need those muscles to be strong in order to support. And as we lose estrogen, as those muscles atrophy, you are going to inherently lose that strength. So if we can start out with those muscles being a little more coordinated, a little stronger in the beginning, that lack of strength that you lose, that, that the strength that you lose, that lack of strength is not going to affect you as much. Those muscles also have to have endurance. You are you walked into Target and the bathroom is in the far left corner and you have had to pee for 45 minutes. You've been holding it and holding it and you have to get out of your car and walk all the way there. If your muscles are only just strong for a brief instant, you're still gonna have leakage before you get there. You have to be able to have a low amplitude contraction of these muscles for a long, longer time in order to make it to where you need to go. And then we talk again about that proper tone and length. The muscles have to be coordinated, they have to be strong, they have to have endurance, and they also have to be able to relax and lengthen to their full ability so that you can completely empty your bladder so that there isn't a lot of residual urine sitting in the bladder, making you feel like you have to pee every five minutes. So there's a lot that goes into your pelvic floor health and really understanding healthy bowel, bladder, and sexual function of the pelvic floor is really what's going to put you um, in a good place as we approach that perimenopause age. There is a lot of a lot of research out there, and I'll, if you just Google, you know, healthy bladder, you're going to find all of these things. Um, there's going to be a ten list of the best things that you can do, but really, it's going to be to try to minimize your bladder irritants. So, drinking enough water, um, trying to stay hydrated, to really try to decrease the concentration of your urine within the bladder is going to help with some of that urgency. Now I know you have leakage, you have urge, you don't want to drink water. You're trying to limit how much water you're drinking, but really having that concentrated urine within the bladder is going to um, really just make you feel like you have to pee more frequently. So trying to have six, seven, eight glasses of water a day kind of spread out throughout the day is really going to be one of the most helpful things that you can do and one of the easiest changes that you can make today trying to avoid bladder irritants, as I noted. I, of course, it's all the good things. Alcohol, um, fizzy waters, um, sodas, caffeine, so coffee, tea, chocolate, citrus, everything that's good in life is going to be a bladder irritant. So as instead of trying to avoid everything you love, trying to just mix in some water in between. Have a glass of water before your coffee in the morning. Um, have your water in between your sodas throughout the day. Um, I want you to still do enjoy your life, but try to you know, help your bladder be as healthy as it can um, while you're dealing with some of these hormonal changes. Um, and there's there's so much education. I could talk for hours about pelvic health and, and having healthy bladder habits. Um, so I have to cut myself off at some point, but knowing that Kegels aren't going to be the only thing that you can do. Um, as Ashley said, exercise in a gravity, um, in a, in gravity is going to also engage the pelvic floor. So if you're active and you're comfortable being active, that is also going to increase your pelvic floor strength. So not feeling like you have to do hundred Kegels every day, um, but really just being healthy and active is also going to keep those pelvic floor muscles strong. It's never too late to start. 
any of this. The, the bone density, the, the exercise, the, the calcium, the food changes, it's never too late to start. So even if you're on this call and you're 80 and you're saying, man, I missed my chance, that's not true. We can always get some of that strength back, but really the best way to know how your muscles are working is to consult a public health specialist near you, find, have an exam, find out how your muscles are working. Um, can you coordinate them? Sure, you're doing 100 Kegels a day, but are you actually contracting those muscles? Because nine out of 10 people who come in to see me aren't. Most of the time they're pushing or they're holding their breath and they're squeezing their core, they're squeezing their glutes and, and doing a hundred Kegels wrong definitely isn't going to get you anywhere. So it might just be, you have a one session and they say, oh, this is how we're gonna do a Kegel instead. Um, and you do need that strengthening but maybe you also need to learn how to coordinate those muscles. So if you really have any questions on whether or not, you know, where those muscles are, whether or not you're using them right, find, find someone who specializes in pelvic floor and really have them do an exam for you and, and walk you through what a good pelvic floor contraction looks like. And of course, if you guys have any questions for me at the end on what that looks like, we, we can definitely talk that too. All right. And I think, are we, do we have a contact slide at the end for us? I do, let me put that up for us right now. Perfect. Um, all right, so that's just some information on how to contact each of us individually um, in our different office locations. Um, if there's any questions or concerns or any other information that people would like. Um, it looks like we do. If, if anyone has any questions, there is a, a area where you can put in different questions. Um, I want to make sure when I'm, if I'm clicking this, are y'all seeing any of my questions or just the screen? If I do that, can you all see my the questions or no? No. No, no Dr. Gleason, we're just seeing your um, contact slides. Okay, I just want to make sure that I'm going to keep everybody, you know, anonymous as we go through any Q's yeah. and A's. So, and I do, um, I do see a question that I think is is um, towards me. So I'll go with that. Sure. So the most simple pelvic floor exercise would be a Kegel. I mean, that's that is going to be what is contracting those muscles. So if you've never heard of a Kegel, it's basically squeezing the pelvic floor muscles up and in. I know that sounds really confusing, um, but if you've ever, and I don't want you to do this, don't go home and do this, but just imagine if you've ever tried to stop the flow of urine while you were peeing, those would be the muscles that you were using. Or if you've ever had to try to hold passing gas in a crowded room, those are gonna be the muscles. Um, so don't go home and try to hold in your pee while you're peeing, don't do that but it is those muscles. So it's, it really is a closing, a squeezing and a lift up and in. So most of the time if those muscles are weak, it is kind of hard to feel that if you're in a sitting or standing position, the easiest way um, to perform a Kegel is gonna be laying down because you're not working against gravity. So that pelvic floor contraction is done best on your exhale. So when you breathe in, you're gonna stay really relaxed. And as you breathe out, you're gonna to try to contract those pelvic floor muscles. So those muscles right around the urethra or the rectum, you're gonna to try to pull them up up and in towards your belly button. It sounds really silly, but you can imagine that you have a blueberry at the entrance of your vagina and you're gonna to try to gently pull that in. I know it sounds bizarre, but a lot of times that helps. Hopefully that was helpful. If we Okay, so I see again, what are some less common ones? Um, so really I do a lot of exercise in conjunction with Kegels. So you can kind of add that into squatting, bridging, um, any of your core exercises. That's another good way to incorporate that in. Um, I also like to work some of the bigger accessory muscles. So if you have like a small ball or a pillow roll or a towel, if you lay down on the floor um, with your feet on the floor, so your knees are going to be bent, or you could do the sitting, you can squeeze the ball in between your knees. That is going to activate the adductors, but it's also going to kick the pelvic floor muscles on a little bit. Um, so that's a good one that I like to use that can be pretty easy. 
Another way to recruit accessory muscles as well as the pelvic floor is to put a band around your knees. Same position, laying down, feet flat on the floor, knees bent, and almost as if you were gonna do a bridge. And then you can bring your knees out against that band. So it's kind of like a laying down clamshell. Um, that is also gonna recruit those pelvic floor muscles by way of the, the glutes on the outside of your hips. Um, you can also do that seated. Those are some of the most basic ones. I like to get more functional when people are stronger and know um, that they're using their pelvic floor properly. And you can do Kegels with a sit to stand from a chair. You could do Kegels while marching, while walking uphill um, on an incline treadmill. So you can really add them to any, um, any exercises you're already performing to make it a little bit harder. There's another question um, we have on here, and I think this might be a good one for Ashley. Um, so talking about um, patients with osteopenia, uh, are plyometrics contraindicated or recommended to increase bone density? What are your thoughts on that? So Ma, I have a couple thoughts here, and it's this, I'm giving a general answer to what really is a specific patient um, individualized uh, question. So Number one, I would say is communicate with their, their primary healthcare provider. So is their DEXA score negative one where they're pretty close to normal bone density, but maybe just osteopenic, or are they closer to that negative 2.5 where they're really going into osteoporotic? What medications are they on? Are they taking anything to help increase bone density or help slow bone density loss? Um, in general, I would say that with osteopenia, it's a little bit more of a relative contraindication where I wouldn't say that nobody can do it if they're osteopenic, but it's really going to depend on the person, which is probably not the answer you were exactly looking for, but I think it's a little bit too um, individualized person dependent question. So I would stick with things like weighted exercise, making sure that they're against gravity, using heavier weights, not, you know, not heavy, like hundreds of pounds, but a weight that challenges them. That is more than what they do in the day to day and work on building up some bone mass and muscle mass and having them go for that repeat DEXA in a year or two years or so and see has bone density improved. And then can we add in some plyometrics? I think also the term plyometrics is tricky because that involves any kind of jumping, loading, running, that kind of thing. So are you starting with something a little bit easier, right? Maybe you're hopping in place or jumping in place, or maybe it's a jumping jack versus a box jump or running uphill, things like that. So the definition of plyometric is a little bit broad as well. So it's going to be patient dependent. And I think working very closely with their healthcare provider or their primary um, physician who's managing their, their care for osteoporosis is going to be the most important part. And then I just saw another question here about if this webcast is going to be shared. It is, it's being recorded and it should be sent out to the people who have attended and signed up for it. So that shouldn't be an issue. And then there's another question in here. Um, if you were just diagnosed with osteoporosis, is seeing an osteopath a type of treatment that is found helpful? Um, I think it definitely can be. It depends on again, I'm very sorry for these kind of vague answers, but it depends on what that osteopath does, right? Um, not all physical therapists are built the same, not all th orthopedic surgeons are built the same. So finding a healthcare provider that you really click with, I think is the most important thing instead of necessarily their title. So someone who really understands like what your goals are, right? So is your goal to get back to playing with grandkids or is it to, you know, run a marathon and finding someone who is in line with your goals and working and willing to work with you on getting there, I think is more important than seeking out a specific kind of provider and seeing an osteopath might be really helpful, but that just might be one part of your care team. So maybe also consulting with a nutritionist or a personal trainer or someone else who can just help kind of the, the overall physical picture that you have. Okay, so I think that's all the questions we have for now. Um, thank you all for um, attending and thank you for the feedback that so many people offered and just, I, we hope this was really helpful and informative. Um, as was mentioned before, yes, this will be available for reevaluation or reviewing. Um, it'll be sent out to everybody. It'll also be um, available on the orthopedic and neurosurgery website. So there'll be a link for that as well. Um, let's see if there's any other questions before we call it a night, but... Um, I think that's all we have for tonight.
Um, so we really appreciate Ashley, um, Jessica, thank you so much for, for joining and bringing your expertise to this topic. I, you know, it's kind of a broad topic, but I think it's great that we're at least starting to have the conversation about women in particular and how um, health, aging, sports, all these things can affect us overall. So thank you all so much for sharing um, and thank you for coming to the webinar and we'll hopefully do it, something like this again um, in the near future. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for having us, Dr. Gleason. All right. Take care. Have a good night, guys. Good night.